Welcome to our series called Yay or Nay, where you get a say on common RV products and topics. We're not only going to cover popular products such as your outdoor gear, your kitchen appliances, and accessories, but we're also going to cover subjects such as boondocking, RV memberships, payloads, weighing your rig, cooking in your RV, and more. We'll give our yay or nay, and then we want you to share your opinion or experience so we can all learn together. Welcome, and we're gonna get right into this video. We're gonna talk about our camping fees at Thousand Trails for the past four years, as well as our favorite parks, worst parks, our dislikes, and our likes. For those of you that are new to Thousand Trails or never heard of it, it can be a very complex camping membership and it is quite confusing. So basically in 2018, we started out with what they call a camping pass. And that just gives you access to one particular zone of the country. We spent about $350 on that. That gave us access to parks in Texas and in Florida and in like the Southern uh, East half of the United States. And so the way the camping pass works is you're allowed to be in the Thousand Trails campgrounds for 14 days and then you have to leave for seven days before you can go back in for an additional 14 days. Now to make things more complicated they had something called a trails collection which is basically the Encore Parks on top of the Thousand Trails. So for an additional $200 in 2018, we got more parks in our membership and those were very helpful down in Florida in our very first year. Now what we really wanna talk about in this video is the annual membership and that's something we purchased at the end of 2019 after a full year of living full time in our Sprinter van and really deciding that we liked this Thousand Trails membership for the most part, it was gonna work with our lifestyle. So let's get into the numbers. I have my favorite little spreadsheet, crunching some numbers right in front of me. Starting in October of 2019, that's when we bought our used membership. We bought a used Platinum. Yes, it was called a Platinum membership and basically that gave us full access to nationwide parks and gave us perks such as a 90 day booking window instead of a 60 day booking window as well as allowing us to stay inside a park for 21 days and allowing us to go to another Thousand Trails park back to back, they call that. So we didn't have to stay out that seven days. So that used membership cost us $3,000. And then additionally, we do have annual dues. That's $549 per year. And we did add on the trails collection. So that's $214. Our grand total for that year was $3,763. Now that first year, we spent 161 nights in the park, making our average rate per night $23.37 was our average per night. And that cost is a little bit higher because we had that initial sunken cost of the membership, which remember that $3,000 is a one-time fee for the rest of our ownership. Now, some people choose to buy a new membership, which is usually about almost double that cost. So five, $6,000 for the same membership. Some people go that route in order to finance it. We did not want to carry any debt into this lifestyle or any of our lifestyle. And so uh, the used membership was the best value. Uh, you do have to pay straight up cash for that. So then moving next into 2020, that was our second year using the full membership. So our total for the year was $861.18, 139 nights total. And if you divide the fees for that year for the nights, the average is $6.20 per night. So you can already see at year number two, we are camping at an insanely cheap amount for parks that uh, are full hookup and that we can stay at back to back to back. $6.20 is pretty crazy. That year we actually spent fewer nights in the parks compared to other years because it was our first year boondocking and we really loved being out west, out on BLM land. Typically on average, we like to say we spend about 50% of our nights in a Thousand Trails park throughout the year and the other 50% of the nights are out boondocking on free land. So on our third year, 
2021. Now keep in mind, this is the year that we paid the dues and our camping nights are actually the following year. Our total paid in 2021 was $887. And then in 2022, where we actually used that membership, we camped 209 nights. So that definitely went up a little bit and that is because we were over on the East Coast more and this collection really shines on the East Coast because you don't have as many options to do boondocking on the land on the East Coast. Our average nightly rate for that was $4.25 and that is so cheap. But there's an asterisk by that because 24 of those nights we actually spent in premium Thousand Trails parks which carries an additional fee of $20 per night. And what are premium parks? Well, they're usually really awesome, really beautiful, in really great locations. And I would say that $20 is worth it. Yeah, so we spent two weeks in the Florida Keys, uh, which is definitely worth $20 a night. Usually those parks are well over 100 to almost $200 per night. And then when we first got Louie, we had to book a special park in Tucson, which carried a $20 per night fee because it was kind of a resort, had a built-in restaurant, bunch of amenities, things like that. So with those extra $20 per night fees, it, it did bump it up to $6.54 per night, but still an insanely cheap amount to pay for camping. Okay, so that's kind of the nitty gritty details of the money. Hopefully that wasn't too boring. I know sometimes it's fun to see what people actually spend on camping. I know uh, early on when we were planning on this lifestyle in 2017, 2018, I think we first found about Thousand Trails through the getaway couple. And I think they did something, a video on, mm -hmm. you know, how much they're spending or even explaining the Thousand Trail system because it's quite confusing at first, but it's definitely something I think we had to go over. But what we really wanna talk about next is some of our favorite parks, our worst parks, and then our likes and dislikes, because it's it's one of those things where you either love Thousand Trails or you hate Thousand Trails. So there should be some good comments on this video as it is more opinionated. So let's start off with some of our favorite parks because We've spent, you know, five over 500 nights in the Thousand Trail system. We have used this across the country, and there's some good ones out there. Yeah, and we have no idea how many parks we've actually stayed in, but it's a lot. So I think the first one that comes to mind of being our favorites is the Florida Keys. There's actually two parks in the Florida Keys. We've stayed at both of them, and it's the Florida Keys. So that, how do you go wrong there? And sticking with Florida, uh, a park that I, I don't want to say it's our absolute favorite, but we've heard from a lot of people it's their favorite and we've been there just last year. So that's the Thousand Trails Orlando. It's actually one of the largest parks in the system. I think there's well over a thousand sites. So it's a very large park. And I want to say, I think it's more popular with the families because it's a great spot for children to be with their friends, to meet up with other families on the road. Yes. And of course, to be close to Disney World. Florida is extremely popular in the wintertime for RVers. And they just recently have been doing a lot of upgrades. And so they have these new big mm -hmm. cement 50 amp sites and they don't charge you anything extra for it. So uh, a lot of people love Thousand Trails Orlando. Moving west, we really enjoy several parks in Texas. It's great to have a spot in the central of the United States. So as you're switching from coast to coast, you can break up that trip and do a little stay in between. So we really like Lake Conroe. It has an awesome swimming pool. A lot of the amenities and perks that we'll talk about in our favorite things about Thousand Trails are at this location. Airball. We also really like Colorado River. It just is a really peaceful place, great for walking, nice and tranquil, and it just has a really good feel to it. Texas parks seem to be big out in the country. Uh, a lot of beautiful kind of lush land around and trees. It's kind of out in the country, but at the same time, they're nice and located around the big cities as far as Houston and Austin mm -hmm. and San Antonio. So Texas has a, a good handful of parks that we enjoy to stay at. Okay, on the West Coast, probably one of our favorite parks is Palm Desert or Palm Springs. That's the thousand trails that you see with all the pictures of the palm trees. And it's not a big park, but it's super centrally located. It's it's very well run. 
it's all full hookup and it's just one of those parks that we go to around the holidays so it always makes us think of Christmas and you know it's California. It's Palm Springs. You yeah. don't really need to say anything more. It is our little sanctuary and we don't share it very often because it's our private little happy place. <laughs> it's not that private though. There's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah but we do love it. We do. And then also on the West Coast during our first year, which we haven't been back to yet, is a handful of parks on the ocean in Oregon and Washington, right on the coast. The parks are so close to the ocean that you can literally walk there in like five minutes. And the parks are old, they're not that great, but being able to wake up and go walk on the ocean is pretty amazing. Uh, all included in the membership. Sometimes your favorite locations are dictated by the park itself, how it's ran, how nice it is, and other time your favorite locations are dictated by its actual physical location. And it's just in an awesome spot. Like being on the Oregon coast, it is so therapeutic to be on the water. Okay, talking about the worst parks that we've been at, um, we're gonna say a generalized statement and then we're gonna talk about two parks that kind of stand out. Because generally speaking, Thousand Trails is kind of 50-50 one way or the other. Some parks are updated, they're well taken care of, management's on top of it, they're fun to be at, they have nice spaces, full hookups, everything's great. And on the flip side, a lot of the parks feel like they're from 1970 and you can see like you can imagine actually how it would be in its heyday yeah. of people camping there uh but fast forward 50 years later no updates and just it, run down and yeah, cringy it just has that creepy kind of vibe and so while you know they're still okay to stay at there is a lot of parks that um just haven't been updated and don't have that great family fun camping feel to it. But we did have uh, one really horrible experience. <laughs> like th this we can say like this park was horrible. Horrible. <laughs> they missed the bat with everything in this. And so this was on the East Coast. It was in New Jersey. It was on our first year on the road in 2019. We think it's called Chestnut Lake. It was on Memorial Day weekend. This park was packed was packed and it had a lot of weekenders there and so right off the bat uh, they had septic issues and guess whose rv was at the very tail end of the septic where all of the eruption was happening yeah there so the way this park was set up and again a lot of these parks haven't been updated they're not ready for the large amount of people or um the way people camp yeah and so the end of the sewer line I don't know if it was downhill or how it actually worked out but on the back side of our site that sewer pipe was the end of the line mm -hmm. and because this was so busy uh, the camp said campground said they couldn't get somebody out there to pump their septic system because it was a holiday weekend mm -hmm. so that's that's mistake number one not planning for this holiday that is you know coming yeah. up and then i think mistake number two when this problem did erupt they didn't come and talk to the affected sites like nobody was there to communicate what was happening eventually what they did like two days later now there is like standing septic water in these sites Very yeah so let's say what happened so basically <laughs> sewage was pumping up from the system and overflowing like an artesian well yeah basically like, like big and this is very dangerous for people that have children or animals yeah it was on the back side of our site but it was on the front side of our neighbor site so their yard and it was on the back side of ours yeah. literally like crime scene tape type of thing that that they like taped off this area finally after like but days, they left us sitting there after days of us complaining about it they brought bags of lye was it lye Whatever that very chemical, like toxic powder is that you put on a dead, dead body. Dead bodies. Was it the same? Yeah. I think that was lie. And but here's the thing though. They didn't say, hey, we're gonna come by and sprinkle lie at six o'clock tonight. They just came by and doused us with everything coming onto our rig. People were outside like no warning no nothing it was very inappropriate and i must to be fair say that was three years ago four years ago and it could 
now be under excellent management with zero issues. So this is an old experience that could be completely irrelevant to 2023. Yeah. So the second park we're going to mention isn't as bad of an experience as that, but this is in Fort Lauderdale, right by Miami. It's the closest park to Miami. Uh, it's an inner city park, meaning, you know, it's right inside the city. Uh, it's a very old campground, so the spots are really tight. There's a lot of uh, people living there, I think. And this is just uh, one of the worst campgrounds that we've been to, just the way they have it set up. Not only are you back to back uh, where you're parking here, but your neighbor is also here. So your patio uh, and their patio Oh, are, yeah. Are, you're sharing the patio. I don't know if I can explain it's that like right. You basically have this It's like you're same. arranged like you're camping together. Yeah. So not only do you have somebody right next to you on your backside or your driver's side of your RV, but on your patio side, you have uh, your other neighbor. It's there. patio to patio. Yeah. Kind of like kitty corner, but, you know, 10 feet apart. So it's super tight spots and uh, very unfriendly type of feeling there. Not a lot of people like saying hello or hi or talking to you. Um, and now it some was... people might really love it because you right are right on South Beach, right? Like you're right next to South Beach. Yeah, 15 minute drive to the beach, I think, yeah. And that's a good segue to our general dislikes of parks. Now, a lot of these experiences that people have that might say, oh, this is the worst park ever, it could just be a generalized blanket statement of having some of these dislikes happen at a specific place at a time where you're just not in the mood to deal with it. The first one that we have listed is that 70s outdated feel that Aaron had already mentioned. It is on this list and it is worth mentioning twice because that is one of people's biggest complaints about Thousand Trails. It seems that they're doing a lot of updating and upgrading of these parks, but you're talking years and years and years of, of planning this out. So some are getting better. They're redoing maybe the bathrooms, they're redoing the pool, things like that. But to do an entire campground takes forever. Mm -hmm. And in general, some of these parks are just very, very rundown, very, very rural and uh, can definitely not give you the greatest of camping experience. And the next one is laundry rooms. Speaking about things that might not be fully updated, laundry rooms are hit or miss. Some of them will have really nice laundry room facilities that are excellent and other campgrounds might have horrible laundry rooms, if they even have one. A lot of them don't have laundry all together. Some of them actually have like 15 machines. Yeah. But 75% of them are out of order. Yeah. Like it's that type of, you know, they just, they do not fix them. They're mm -hmm. very expensive and they just leave the couple machines working and that can just be really frustrating. Yeah. So for us, that is important because we do not have a washer and a dryer inside of our RV. If you have your own washer dryer, that's irrelevant, right? You can just hook up to the water and do your laundry but we do need to use machines somewhere else and it's hard for us because we go two or three weeks without doing laundry while we're out boondocking and then we come to an rv park to freshen up all of our stuff and if they don't have a laundromat that's in good condition that's a big negative for us so sometimes you need to actually go to the laundry mat which may not be very close to the park and that's what the next point is is that some of these parks the location is really out in the middle of nowhere thankfully we have almost 200 parks in our reservation uh, system so like there's a lot to choose from as you kind of travel around but also a lot of parks are just out in the middle of nowhere so if we're going to stay somewhere for you know a good week two weeks, three weeks, just to slow things down a little bit and reset, that's where you can really save a lot of money. Um, you know, three weeks uh, campground fee, if you're gonna just go pay that straight up somewhere, could easily be, you know, $500 mm -hmm. right off the bat, if not more. But then for me, I find shopping is a little bit more difficult. You know, you might find a Walmart. It seems like Dollar Generals are everywhere, but I do not buy groceries at Dollar General. I want fresh produce, I want fresh food. And in those rural locations, you might have to actually say, I have to drive 45 minutes to get to a really nice grocery store. Um, also in those rural locations, you might find your cell service or your internet service is a little spotty and that can be a big determining factor. I think that would be the only 
thing that would say we're not going to this park at all if we didn't have service there. Well, now we have Starlink, but early on in our years, yeah. we did not. So there's been uh, a couple parks we've had to use Starlink at um, just to get service to continue to stay there. So definitely something to think about, becoming less and less of a problem if you have redundancy backups as well as Starlink. Uh, but it's definitely something that we're always paying attention to. And moving along the list, not all parks have full hookups at every site. So when you go to an RV park, you expect to have the perks of water, electric, and full sewage at each site. Well, that's not the case. So that was really hard for us, especially when we were in the van, when we had tiny tanks, and we would have to go drive to dump every few days. It's a little bit easier now. We have a rig that can easily handle a week's worth of dry camping, uh, but still a pain in the butt if you need to get up and either use like dollies or blue boys to yeah. dump your tanks or to just move and actually go take your RV to the dump station. That can be pretty tough. All sites will have electric and water, but it's the sewer that uh, you have to watch out for. And speaking of electric, you also have to watch out for that. Yeah, the electrical boxes and the electrical system, the whole grid in these RV parks can be very outdated. Again, from the 70s, they don't look like they've been changed. And there may, may be numerous sites that actually they have bagged off so that you can't even camp in that site or you might go into a site and hook up and it just doesn't work. Like that can happen. Not a lot, but I think it's happened at least once or twice to us. Um, so that's something like you need to think about as well as the voltages in the park. We have a great surge protector built into our system so that we're protected from high voltage and low voltage. So electrical upgrades, I think is what Thousand Trails is doing most, but again, it's a slow process. Another thing to note on the sites themselves is sometimes they can be stacked in quite tightly, similar to what we discussed at the Fort Lauderdale park where these are really small back-in sites and they're really, really tight. Now, not all of them, but some of them. Some parks will charge for 50 amp service, other parks might not. Some have guest fees, which we don't really ever have guests, but you could imagine having to spend $10 per guest to have them come, you know, use the pool for the day. Uh, so there's different types of fees that different parks actually charge. And, you know, it's something to be considerate. It's never really caused huge issues for us, but it's just one more thing to be aware of when you're in the system. Mm -hmm. And not only are policies inconsistent, but also general vibes are inconsistent. So some parks are amazing and have this incredible energy. People are outside, active, super friendly. Everybody is like, recreating and having an awesome time, people of all ages, really, really great experience. Other times, people kind of keep to themselves and are very crabby. <laughs> like we've been many places where we'll say hi and wave to somebody on a walk and they don't even say hi back. So let's end on a positive note. And these are all the great things that we love about Thousand Trails. Yes starting out with how nice some of the parks actually are when you get to these nice great well-run beautifully landscaped concrete pads big sites mm -hmm. you get to these some parks. of the sites are awesome mm -hmm. and it's great like great locations uh, great neighbors, great neighbors, friendly people mm -hmm. weather. awesome laundry rooms basically everything we said in that dislike list they all are on the love list. If you invert that, they do exist at several parks. There's a handful of parks that are well over $100 per night. Retail. Just retail price yeah. for people to pay. Uh, so when we're staying there for free within our membership, uh, that is a great feeling. And there's a reason that they charge for those parks because mm -hmm. they're, they're really nice. So to have them included in our membership is an excellent perk and probably one of the biggest reasons that we're still using Thousand Trails because it's pretty nice. Even when you do consider in some parks that do have that extra $20 rate, um, you know, those are actually a perk and something we like because those parks are in awesome locations. So we're talking about the Florida Keys, you know, one in Tucson that we went to. We went to one in San Francisco. 
Yep, they and have them in Lake Tahoe, they have them in Bend. The Everglades, uh, Florida. Paso Robles in mm. California. Like there's just these great fun touristy type of locations and uh, to stay there for $20 a night is a great extra value. Yeah, so some of the locations, as we mentioned on the dislike list, while some locations are very rural and out in the middle of nowhere, some of these locations are awesome. Like right in Las Vegas, all these great places that we just listed for a premium. Like some of them are really, really great locations. So Thousand Trails is really easy to use. They have a great online booking system. Uh, we have a 90 day window so you can book 90 days out as well as cancel like if it's not going to work out or we're going to change routes or just simply revise your dates yeah which happens quite a bit uh you know there's no fees in doing that so it's really easy and simple so we have a handful of ways we like to camp boondocking thousand trails uh harvest hosts national parks state parks cracker barrel like you know Campendium we use for all of our boondocking. We just have like a handful of things that we go to mm -hmm. and it eliminates kind of that fatigue and trying to find a place to camp. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna end on the note again of the value of Thousand Trails. I think that's why people use it. I think that's what attracted us to it in the first place. And after using it year after year after year, we find the value is a good value for us. And so, you know, reiterating that first year of spending uh, for the used membership and all of our nights of camping, it was $23 average per night. So that's, cheap. That's really, really cheap. And then the next year, it dropping down to $6. I mean, if we really wanted to use Thousand Trails, we could probably get our camping down to like three dollars a night yeah and like if we were on the east coast all year long mm -hmm. that is definitely what would happen chris do you love it do you hate it i 100 percent love it <laughs> i love it i think it is just it's like one of the best things that we found early on and i'm so glad we have the membership and as long as it stays the way it is i think we'll use it the rest of our life yeah i don't want to say i love it what but it's a definite yay for me. I mean, it's just a no brainer value. Even if we barely used it, you know, it can pay for itself by us just staying uh, for three weeks in a park right there is $500. You love it, you love it. I do not love it, but I do like it. And I think, you know, it works for us. But we wanna know, is it a yay for you? Is it a nay for you? Have you even heard of Thousand Trails? If not, where have you been? It's, I think, one of the most popular camping things for full timers. If you're just a part-timer, it might not make a lot of sense. It's, you do have to spend a certain amount of nights to break even. So you might have just, to earn that ROI, guys. You really do. So it's one of those things that you kind of got to get your own little spreadsheet out, figure it out for cost and everything. So thanks again, everybody, for watching this video, and we'll see you on the next one. Speaking of camping, if you want to get crazy and camp with us and the entire cast and crew of RV Unplugged, you can. Next month in Athens, Texas on May 4th through the 7th, 2023, sites are still available and you can still get an early bird discount with code IRENE15. I'll leave a link down below with all of the details. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Also, if you're already signed up, let us know with a comment down below. We'll see you there.